few savings. Beef blade chuck steak, bone in, Canada grade A, 99 cents a pound. U.S. Bartlett pears, only 44 cents a pound. And Old Dutch potato chips, the big 200 gram box, only 88 cents. You can't buy better than, can't buy better than, can't buy better than, buy low. You can't buy better than, buy low. At Ed's Linen Warehouse, your everyday savings are spectacular. Brand name, linen and bedding at savings of 45 to 75 percent. Ed's Linen Warehouse is Western Canada's largest discount linen and bedding supermarket. Offering top quality merchandise at the lowest prices in town. Ed's Linen Warehouse, where linen and bedding is offered at below the border prices. Hurry for the best selection to Ed's Linen Warehouse, 7731 Alderbridge Way, Richmond. Good morning. When John Turner became leader of the Liberal Party at the convention in June and automatically became Prime Minister, it seemed to many that he was an automatic shoe-in, that he would vanquish the income of Moroni. And where does Mr. Turner, the Prime Minister of Canada, stand now? According to the polls, according to the experts, he's headed into the greatest debacle the Liberal Party has seen since the rump parliament of Pearson in the 60s. Mr. Turner is here this morning. Brian Maroney wouldn't show, I must say that in all fairness, and I'm going to throw every single tough question I can in the book at Prime Minister John Turner to see where he stands both on his philosophies, his campaign, and what he would do in the unlikely event he becomes Prime Minister of Canada. Good morning, Prime Minister, and we'll be back after the break. I'll now be accused of being a liberal fink. <laughs> oh. They're loaded for bear. Huh? Sure. Change lively. Mr. Turner, Prime Minister, Pierre Trudeau said yesterday in a very snitty manner that he had, he had not been following the campaign. I want to ask you how much you blame the man whom you described as the remarkable Trudeau for the mess your party is now commonly believed to be in. Is the fact that you're fighting against the arrogant years of Trudeau, is that what's knocked you off in the polls right now? I think, Jack, what, uh, what we're facing in, in this election is a feeling on the one hand uh, of uncertainty into the country, where we're going, how we're going to get there. There's obviously uh, the fact that uh, the Liberal Party, with one interruption, has been in power for roughly 20 years. That's a factor I have to contend with. But what I'm saying to the Canadian people is, look, you know where I stand. I've costed every program I've brought before you. I've tried to analyze the programs of the country as best I can. I've indicated the directions I want to take Canada. I've expressed my concern and some solutions for our terrible unemployment problem with so many men and women out of work in this country and in British Columbia. And um, I'm getting that message through, and we still have, um, we still have a week to go. And your message is your message, don't blame me for the mess that Trudeau left? I'm saying I'm a fresh face. I've been out of politics for eight years. I had some experience as a member of parliament for 14 years. I was in the government for 10. I came back because I thought I could do, do uh, serve Canada well, and I thought I could do a job for Canada. What was the biggest single difficulty that Trudeau landed in your lap, which has caused you a lot of trouble? Well, I suppose that um, an issue that has come up, and I, I think really doesn't relate to the fundamental problems of the country, is the concern in Canada about, about patronage. And um, I've gone over that. I've 
stated that my style will be my style, the style I used uh, when I was Minister of Justice. Do you mind if I go over it, Mr. Tenney? Why don't we do that? I thought you were going to do that anyway, Jack. Because the one thing that seems to kick you right in the teeth with the interested people is the stench of patronage. So let's start right off it. Are you going to remove Mackesy as a potential ambassador for Portugal? I, uh, I made an undertaking uh, to the Prime Minister. He could have made all those appointments himself. I, uh, I operated on the basis of the facts I had at the time, Jack. I operated on the basis of the advice I received at the time. I completed some of those appointments in order to preserve a majority in the House of Commons. And I live by my word. And uh, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to use hindsight. I would think that if you or Brian Mulroney or anyone else were in that position, you would have probably come to the same conclusion I did. But I tell you, uh, look at my record when I had some responsibility for appointments. Look at the judges I appointed across Canada including Tom Berger here in, in British Columbia. I didn't limit them to liberal appointees. I went across the board to NDP and to Tories, people with no political affiliation at all. True, but with That will be my style. But with hindsight, do you now confess or admit that it was a mistake to sign that secret deal with Trudeau, I believe, put to you in the presence of the caucuses of further insurance of that tough man? Well, there's no doubt about it that the Prime Minister uh, uh, went to caucus before I was sworn in and told the caucus that he would get an undertaking from me and if he didn't he would appoint those uh, those and uh, make those appointments but uh, yes it is an issue yes was it a mistake yes people have been concerned I have got the message from the Canadian people and I'm just saying to Canadians you know my style that was the end of an era and I am going to search out the best men and women of quality and caliber regardless of political affiliation and I will do the same type of consultation I did when I held office. Just let me get this clear, sir. Are you telling me that Trudeau, had he appointed these MPs, 17 or 19, whatever it was, by himself, that you might not have been able to form a government at that juncture? Is that what you're telling me, that the Governor General might have sent for Mulroney? That is right, sir. Was this Trudeau's advice to you? This was the advice I got from the Clerk of the Privy Council and from the Department of Justice and from some others. So that was why you signed the deal? That, uh... That was the only way that I could have a whole list of options as to whether to form a government, to whether to uh, call an election or not call an election. And as I say, Mr. Trudeau had the uh, ultimate discretion himself as Prime Minister to make all those appointments if he wanted. But don't you think, looking back now, that if you had, forgive the word, broken the deal, that you'd be re leading the race today? I don't, uh, I don't break my word. I take responsibility for my decisions. I know what the Canadian people think about it, but I'm asking the Canadian people to judge me in the future on the style I indicated when I was in office. Will you release the Trudeau Turner letter? I think that that is a letter between two, two prime ministers and the custom is that that, that remain confidential. And Mackenzie's future has yet to be decided or is he unalterably going to be the ambassador to Portugal? I suppose if uh, Portugal accepts Mr. Mr. Mackenzie, he will be ambassador to Portugal. And if he doesn't, will he get another appointment? Not for me, sir. Mr. Turner, I'm old fashioned, a little bit of a chauvinist. But do you believe that the media really kicked you in the teeth in what has been called bum patting and that it was a bit of a conspiracy to get you, to paint you as a macho jock who was totally out of touch from the 60s? Is that what you well, feel about that? Because you were totally embarrassed. I think the issue was overblown. One or two isolated instances among political friends, a gesture of affection. It wasn't taken in offense by, by either the, the two women, but it did apparently cause some concern among a number of uh, women in the country, and I apologized if it caused anybody any offense. But I think it was a, it's an, irre it's an irrelevant issue. My, my concern for women and women's issues is, is, is well known. Uh, I've spoken ever since I came back to, to public life about the necessity of giving women an equal partnership in this country, uh, equal access to jobs, equal access to promotions, and so on. So I think, you know, my whole conduct and, 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 and attitude towards women and what I want to see them enter the equal partnership of this country is something that really people ought to take into consideration. Key question. Yeah. When John Turner appeared at the convention, he seemed like he, a knight in somewhat right-wing armor, the guy who's going to cure the deficit. Then suddenly, wham, you fire Bill Lee, or he fires you, one or the other. In comes the good old hardy annual boy in the back room, Keith Davy, of all people. And suddenly you become a left-wing liberal again, promising the kingdom of heaven to women and everybody else in the country. Were you forced to change your 
structure and your direction in the campaign because of the fact that your right-wing leanings were going to cause you to lose. In no way, Jack. If you follow me right through the leadership campaign, from when I entered that campaign on March the 16th, right through until June the 16th when the delegates elected me as leader, you'll see that my classic liberalism, my concern about a strong private sector with space for entrepreneurship, but at the same time a concern for people, a, a compassion for those who, who can't protect themselves, for the disadvantaged, for the unemployed, for the aged, that was there continually right through my campaign for the leadership and there's been no change in my attitude since uh, Senator Davis with joined my campaign. And you welcome him. Well, I mean, you were the guy who said no rainmakers in my government. Well, I said no rainmakers in the back rooms. I'm going to be running an upfront government, and if Senator Davey has something to do with that government, it will be an upfront government. It won't be run by non-elected people. I can assure you that. Davey, now, Davey won't lead you around by the nose. He never has. Davey and I both entered the party under Mr. Pearson, mm -hmm. and uh, whereas uh, Jack, you, and other members of the media concentrate on Davey, I have brought hundreds of new people into the Liberal Party. They're working here in British Columbia. They're working in Saskatchewan, mm -hmm. Manitoba, Alberta, and Western Canada. A whole new generation of liberals in the rest of the country. Take a look at them. That's what I'm bringing All in. All right, let's take a look at your particular promises and specific uh, pledges for the election with Prime Minister John Turner running in Quadra. Going to get slaughtered? I'm going to get elected in Quadra. After the break. Hi, Ms. Uh, Walsh, how are you? Hi. Good to see you. Mr. Turner, Prime Minister of Canada, at least until September the 4th. Mr. Turner, I want to speak for the man in Kamloops, a push coupe, a Prince George, who's 44 years of age, he's got a sick wife, four kids, hasn't paid his mortgage for two years. And he tells me there isn't a damn thing from any of these politicians, which means I can get back to work in my job. He says, all I see are pandering to women, phony programs about grants and loans to youth, what are you going to do and when for the unemployed in this country, male and female, without all this long-range nonsense? Well, you've talked about the essential problem in the country. And it's true that we have programs for youth to try to train them. And it's true that we have... And they sound like lip grants. No, they're not lip grants. They're, they're, they're apprenticeship programs, and I think they meet, they meet a very serious need in this country. Half the uh, children who come into the, uh, the workforce have graduated only from high school, and we've never had a program to match skills with what the, to match training to the skills I, I, that are needed. But let's talk about the ordinary man and woman. Yeah, let's talk about it from the point of view the, that the, 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 the or, economy's in a mess. The economy has come out of the most brutal three years since we've had since the Big Depression. Out of it? It's coming out of it, slowly. It's coming out of it, and it's, it's been painful. And speaking here as a British Columbian, what we've got to do first of all is ensure that those export-oriented industries, mining and forestry, find and retain markets again. And I've give, given an undertaking to the Canadian people that I consider the office of Prime Minister as one of getting out and selling personally for this country and selling personally for this province. Selling in Japan, selling in Latin America, selling in Europe, <laughs> ensuring that our markets are, are intact in the United States. That is a personal commitment and that selling means jobs. Because if those markets are enhanced and protected, that's where the primary jobs are, are coming to British Columbians in the forestry and the mining industry. Sir, that's a great political speech. But Not you're the man who was Minister of Finance. You know better than I do that 33 cents in every dollar in tax you get goes to pay debt. Now, you know how you got that figure? Because you worked I, it out. I worked it out, and I gave that figure in Edmonton. When I was Minister of Finance, that figure was 10 to 13 cents. All Doesn't right. that cripple at a cover? That, that was 10 to 13 cents when I was Minister of Finance. And I ought to remind you, Jack, that I was the last Minister of Finance to have, have a surplus in this country. In fact, I had two surpluses running. Now, what I'm saying is that public debt has reached a stage where we've got to get it under control over a period of years. But we can't do it on the backs of the man and woman you're talking about in Kamloops, the unemployed or the sick or the aged or the disadvantaged in this country. We've got to bring that under control over a period of years. But let's get back to those jobs. That's what I'm trying to say, sir. How, when the world trade is in such a mess, can you or Mulroney or Broadbent do anything except wait for world trade recovery? I tell you, I wouldn't wait. I would go out and sell for Canada, and that means jobs. I take a very active view. And if you recall, Jack... So the hell I with the deficit. No, that's the selling. Selling has nothing to do with the deficit. I'm trying to find markets for us. 
And when I, uh, you know, when I had the, the honor to be the chairman of that International Monetary Fund, which is the largest international financial organization in the world, I made friends all over the world for Canada, and I'm going to use those friendships and sell. We're going to enhance small business. We're going to, we're going to uh, modernize and rationalize our major industries in this country. We're going to have those training programs and retraining programs. Is and we're going to have to have, again, a climate of confidence in this country where investors will invest and expand, and that's going to give us the, the jobs. The climate of confidence you can produce, but let me deal with one of Broadbent's things in Oshawa. Broadbent says, we got our 60% content of Canadian car, of, of Japanese cars made in Oshawa. You know what's happening to our coal here. The Japanese come in and say, yeah, we'll take it, but slash the price. You know why we pay such incredible prices for children's clothing here? Because of the protectionism of industry in Ontario and Quebec. What will you do to enable us to buy from Pacific Rim countries their cheaper materials while we're flogging our raw materials to them? Are you prepared to lift some of the protectionism in Ontario and Quebec? Jack, trade is a two-way two -way street. And we it's, suffer it's, from it's, it. It's a two-way street. And I'd be very conscious as I am anything I did in terms of enhancing the automobile industry in Ontario and Quebec by more Canadian content, which I believe in, and certainly more investment from Japan and other countries in our automobile industry to make sure that we have Canadian participation. But I'd do that in a way that wouldn't jeopardize the counter trade that comes out of Alberta and British Columbia into those countries. You agree it's jeopardized now? I, no, I don't, think, uh, I don't think it's at risk yet. But I'm conscious that in how we negotiate, to protect our own manufacturing base, we don't do it in a way to harm the Western consumer. And you know the long-term solution? The long-term solution is that if we build up a Western industrial base, a Western manufacturing base, because you're still talking out here as if British Columbia were just a, a raw producer, but if we build out a Western base, which we can do through that Pacific Rim, that's yeah. the largest market in the world. You mean a free port in Vancouver? That's, that's possible. We could look at uh, Vancouver as a financial center, as a banking center, as a trading center into that Pacific Rim. It could be one of the great Pacific Rim centers of the world. And when we move, when we move that trade out through Vancouver and out through British Columbia, then we can afford to build a manufacturing base that will start to rival that of Ontario and Quebec. And you won't have that same complaint in 15 or 20 years. All right, Mr. Turner, one tends in my job to be negative. I want to be positive. Well, that would be I uh, made a snide that, that remark about, about lip grants. Could you spell out to me simply my impression now is that the first, ch first chance for youth is 50 bucks a week for standing in somebody's plant and watching. What is the first chance and how will it train people? The problem that young people are facing, and it's, 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 it's affecting every family, virtually every family in this country, Jack, is that a young person, young fellow, young woman comes out of school and he goes to a potential employer and he said, look, here are my marks, I did pretty well in school. Here's what I've done in the summer, I've tried to pay my way through. I'd like a job. And the potential employer says, well, young man or young, young lady, uh, you don't have any experience. And we have 200,000 unemployed. We have, we have 530,000 unemployed between and 15 and 24. And uh, the employer says, well, I like what you've done with yourself, but you don't have any experience. And the young person says, but sir, of course I don't have any experience. I'm looking for my first job. So we have this conundrum, Jack, of no experience, no job, and no job, no experience, and we've got to give our young people some experience on that resume, we've got to give them a first chance, and that is what this national training program is all about. Are you telling me that I can go to an employer, Jack Webster's 18, John Turner's got a little plant, and I'd say, I'm a first chance character. The government's going to pay me, I can stand around your plant. No, oh, sir. The government will pay you a certain allowance if you work on the job in my plant under my supervision. If we have a union in the plant, we need the cooperation of the union. You need my cooperation as an employer. And is the only money I get the money I get from the government? The money you will get will be the money that gets from the, you get from the government. And if you turn out to be a satisfactory trainee, then surely look, working it out with business and labor, we might be well, able to get some contribution from the individual firms as well. Why not, Jack? Oh, I agree, but the unions will cut your throat. I don't think so. I think, the, I think that the leaders of the... Uh, uh, union movement understand that we not only have an economic problem here with our young people we've got a social and a moral problem and we have got to give them the training and make them eligible to get to work. How much are you putting out in first chance? First chance this year will uh, in this fiscal year will be 80 million dollars but it will be a billion dollar program. And by 1985? By next year. Some of it 
a good chunk of it will get out of uninsur unemployment insurance because the unemployment insurance fund is available for that sort of uh, for that sort no, of no, training. There won't be a new IC. They'll be getting fifty bucks a week from that, the that, fund. You got it. If even if they don't qualify for UIC. Uh, uh, th well, that is right. Uh, that that's available for it. Also, we hope to have the provinces involved. We we hope to have some business uh, uh, businesses involved. Mm -hmm. I think it's I think it's a very important plan, and I think it gives some hope where hope is needed. Mr. Turner, Prime Minister of Canada, we're going to deal with some of the national issues briefly, like NEP, Pedro Canada, to General, then we're going to talk about women's rights. We hope to have some time for phone calls too, but the Prime Minister back after the break. Do you, Mr. Turner, if elected Prime Minister, do you promise an open government? I, uh, I've said that it'll be an open government, it'll be an accessible government, it'll be a government that's accountable, yes. Therefore, if you become Prime Minister, will the Auditor General of Canada be able to drop his suit to try and see the books and some of the National Energy Plan takeovers? We'd uh, hope to look into that. Every, every Crown Corporation should be publicly audited, either by the Auditor General or by a private set of auditors. And every crown You almost said yes to that question. I've said yes, in effect. If yeah. you become Prime Minister, the Auditor General can drop his suit, you'll open the books. I want, it, I want to see the merits of that suit as to whether Petra Canada is subject to the Auditor General's audit or mm -hmm. subject to the, to the private firm of auditors that may have, been, uh, may have been retained. But in any event, every Crown Corporation will be annually audited. It will have an annual mandate report to Parliament. Its board of directors will have specified duties. They don't now. And there will be a review as to whether Crown Corporations still operate to the purpose for which they were designed. Do you agree that the National Energy Program as it applied to the West was the biggest kick in the teeth that Alberta and British Columbia got from Trudeau's government? Shattering the economy, making Calgary a ghost city. Well, I think uh, certainly it wasn't well received in Western Canada and certainly, uh, certainly uh, the general economic cycle at the same time didn't help. Will you correct this imbalance? Well, I've said that that uh, National Energy Program, although I subscribe to the three general objectives, moving our industry towards Canadianization, self-sufficiency by 1990 if we can achieve it, and a fair pricing and fair revenue sharing basis will be part of my policy. But the assumptions upon which that program were based, namely those escalated world prices, didn't materialize, and the import requirements of Canada didn't materialize. So those agreements are open for review with the provinces. And I uh, want to ensure that the producing provinces get a fair shake in those rene renegotiations. And, 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 and I've said, and I've said, whereas the National Energy Program moved exploration and development off provincial onto Canada lands, right. that I would consider that in the immediate uh, self-sufficiency motive that we ought to accelerate exploration and development of our tar sands, our heavy oil in Saskatchewan, Alberta, and of course, I've loosened up the natural gas export for Alberta, Saskatchewan, and British Columbia. And you, would you lift the PGRT, the Petroleum and Gas Resource Tax, which was the big hatchet in the throats of the developers in the prairies? That, uh, that PGRT tax, of course, is a $2.5 billion item. Mulroney just says he's going to lift it. Yeah. Uh, I would rather see a tax on profits than a tax on total, total production. But there would have to be alternative taxes to make up for that tax. Because the scheduled tax is due to come in this fall. You wouldn't stop. You'd, there are sales taxes and other taxes coming uh, in effect this fall. The Minister of Finance in his February budget uh, called for an increase in yeah, sales taxes by October 1st. And I've said I'm going to let that run. Good. I'm going to throw you, a, before I talk about women's rights, I'm going to throw you a nasty one. Are you in favor, and you were Minister of Justice, of a simple amendment to the Criminal Code of Canada to make soliciting in the streets of Vancouver simple soliciting, not pressing and persistent, and thus solve the need for this injunction from the Supreme Court to clear some of our streets? The Debbie Hutt case said it had to be pressing and persistent. No politician in Canada has had the guts enough to say, I will give the, the law the authority by a simple amendment to the criminal code because the women's groups think that any interference with prostitution, male or female, is demeaning. Do you believe there should be a, uh, an amendment to the criminal code to make simple soliciting a street offense? 
I'd like to see a, a better definition of that, Jack, but I, I believe that pressing and persistent is too exclusionary. Stupid. And uh, to try to proceed through the loitering provisions, no good. try to proceed through the nuisance, nuisance provisions, no good. Uh, will not work. Yes, I would want to see a revision to the criminal code to make an effective lifting of this uh, problem in Vancouver and some other western cities. I'll tell you this, too. Paul Fraser, who was the former um, president of the Canadian Bar Association right. here in Vancouver, is Wrong commission. He's giving us a report by the end of the year on, uh, on prostitution and pornography. I'd like to see what definition changes he'd like to see, he'd like to recommend before see, I, before I these, implemented it. Many of these Easterners, Easterners don't realize right now that the Chief Justice of our Supreme Court laid an arbitrary injunction moving a class of people out of an area. I mean, uh, I, uh, shocks me, but he had to do it because of the failure of the law of Canada to deal with the most repulsive problem ever seen on the streets of any Canadian city. Well, I, I, I'll tell you this, Jack, that the problem is primarily a federal criminal law problem, and we're going to meet it. Good. Now, when I watched the women's rights panels, I felt, my goodness gracious me, these three distinguished gentlemen are pandering in the extreme. Do you guarantee $50 million for rape relief centers and transition houses in the petty cash? On that debate, I didn't get into any monetary responses. The others did. They did, but I didn't. Broadbent promises $50 million quick uh, for rape relief. I didn't, I didn't meet that. And you don't? I didn't meet that. And what I said, what we are dealing with in women's issues, so-called, as a matter of fact, there's no such thing as women's issues. There are issues concerning all of society, Jack, in which women have shown us a leadership to the meeting of those issues and the solution of those issues. But let's and go what through. We're, but what we're really dealing here with, we're dealing with fairness, we're dealing with justice, we're dealing with a new partnership in society in which women are going to play an equal part. Now, you know, that's what we're talking about here. How do you do that, though? Equal pay for work of equal value. Will you insist on that in all federal uh, chartered companies like banks and railways? It's part of the law. Equal pay for work of equal value under the Canada Human Rights Act of 1978 is part of the law. It binds the federal public service, it binds federal crown corporations, it binds any institution under federal jurisdiction. Banks, railways, telegraph companies, telephone companies, and yes, that law is going to be applied. Good. What is affirmative action? Does that mean taking a woman, even though she may not be properly qualified, and giving her what has traditionally been the man's job? All right, let's move away now from... I mean, I just don't uh, know what it is, except uh, it seems uh, like discrimination to me. Let me, uh, let me take you away for, from equal equal pay for work of equal value to a different subject, affirmative action. I now, thought it the same thing. Well, it isn't, Jack. But uh, what, what affirmative action is, is giving women equal access to counseling and training, mm -hmm. to job opportunities, to promotional opportunities, to career options. It doesn't interfere with merit. It just gives women an opportunity to qualify oh, for Oh, it doesn't merit. say I'm going to put many dokes into Johnny Doak's job, or Johnny Peter's job. It just says that Mary can compete with Peter on an equal basis. Couldn't she always? Well, I don't think so. I think that there have been hidden biases in the system. Women have not had the same access to uh, uh, no. educational Even and training. Even I will concede that. Even you will concede it that. It pushed. Now, I'm going to tell you, <laughs> what we're talking about, Jack, therefore, is equal opportunity. We're not talking about quotas. Okay. We're not talking no about quotas. we're not talking about any demeaning quotas. No system. tokenism. We're not talking about tokenism. We're talking about allowing women to qualify on a merit basis, on an equal basis. It pleases me. It'll probably drive the National Action Status Council around the bend. The answer. What do we? What do you bid me for daycare for the middle class, Prime Minister? What do you bid me for daycare? I'm not going to bid you anything, Jack. I'm going to... Broadband's I, offering $300 million and 300 from the provinces. Broadband's... And it would seem Mulroney went along with it. Broadband's uh, universal daycare would be a $600 million item. What I've said is that child care, and I'd rather use the words child care, Jack, child care ought to be given in a number of options. In other words, a woman who wants to work outside the home or divide her time at work between the home and outside the home should have some, uh, some options for, for, for child care. She should either be able to provide for child care in her own home or in a neighborhood uh, arrangement where she, she has friends and neighbors helping or in a child care uh, facility at the factory or at the office. You know, now, is that not largely a provincial matter, anywho? It, it, it is basically a provincial matter, but there's going to have to be some federal leadership and to ensure that we have some national standards here. And what I'm, what I'm prepared to do is to look at a financing 
arrangement with the provinces and with industry and with the federal government to ensure that women do have those options for child care, home, neighborhood, or place of work. One last question on that. Uh, uh, broadband threw out $900 million for homemakers' pensions. Um, Mulroney seemed to think when the economy came that would come. Are you committed on a short and long-term basis to homemakers' pensions? I'm committed on a short-term basis to working out and reforming our pension plans, both public and private in this country, so that every person has a right to a reasonable pension and to live in some sort of dignity upon retirement and in the later years. What was that provision you brought in the other day to bring in women under 65 or people getting less than the full old age pension? Well, a guaranteed income supplement now clicks in at 65 years old. Right. There are a lot of women, particularly older people between 60 and 65, who don't qualify either for the old age pension or for the guaranteed income su supplement. Right. And we've lowered the eligibility year from 65 to 64. That costs $300 million, and we're providing for that by an alternative minimum tax which will tax all those over 60,000 in income who pay little or no tax. We're going to put that tax at a min minimum rate of 13%. If the provinces come in, it'll be a minimum rate of 20%. I want to explore that with you for taxing for the rich because the impression is being bruited abroad that there's an exemption for people up to 60,000, which I know is not correct. You're right. If there is, I'll be bloody mad about it when I, when I find out about it after the break. <laughs> Prime Minister, it was a good old broadband who said that there are so many Canadians, hundreds of them, not paying tax on $50,000 a year incomes. And you've come out with some confused plan which says 60000 exemption under minimum tax for rich. What the hell's going on, sir? Well, I, I, I saw that report too, Jack. In the Globe and Mail? In the Globe and Mail. Is it wrong? It's wrong. It's inaccurate? It's inaccurate. I am saying to you that at 60000 no matter what the technicalities are of how to click it in, people earning more than $60,000 a year are going to pay an alternative minimum tax of 13% or if the provinces come in, 20%. There's going to be no, there's going to be no way that uh, by way of the legitimate tax deductions you can bring your income tax down to zero if you're over $60,000. You're talking to keep it simple for people who don't dream of $60,000, the way the $60,000 Anna throws money into tax shelters, right, and avoids taxation for the moment that where they have a zero or less than 13% tax, that'll be slapped onto them. If tax shelters or tax deductions bring a person's income, if he has a, an income of 60000 brings his tax down below 13%, then he will pay at least 13%. That reminds me, you know a fair bit about shelters going wrong, Mr. Turner, don't you? Well, uh, The they, film shelter, CFI, was it? Well, the, the people who invested got their tax shelter. They got it against their income. Uh, about four out of the seven films were not that successful. Three were all right. Did you have to raise a million dollars yourself to pay off the debt? Well, you wouldn't expect me to tell what went on between me and my banker, would you, Jack? Well, yes, I would uh, if you're going to be prime minister. If it was a million dollars, uh, Mr. Tunnel, I would say, my God, he had to borrow a million dollars to pay off his tax shelter. I, uh, if I had to have done that, uh, Jack, I wouldn't be here. Well, that's it. I think we can accept that with respect, deference, and humility, Mr. Tanner. Thank you, Jack. Let's go to uh, the situation. Let's go to your provincial matters. Yes. When you first came on the scene, you seemed to put your foot in your mouth over the provincial rights in Manitoba. Secondly, you then seemed to indicate that there wasn't much wrong with Bill 101. I know you were the man who steered the official languages out through the House of Commons. You do, however, tend to give provincial rights, including languages, more to the province than to the Charter? I think you and I were talking earlier about 30-second clips. Uh, when I first came back to public life, um, I tried to, uh, or I yielded to uh, the entreaties of our, your colleagues in the, in the media to try to encompass all the wisdom of the world in 30 seconds. I don't do that anymore. And what I failed to do at that early stage was to distinguish between the constitutional language rights and those services in the provinces that go beyond those rights. Simple as that. Getting down to a nutshell. The constitutional yes. language rights are as clear as a bell where number warrants. When, where numbers warrant. Well, well, the constitutional rights are there. That includes, includes education where the numbers warrant. Uh, then the courts have a duty to enforce those, and Parliament and the legislatures have a duty to, to enforce them as well. Language rights beyond those constitutional rights uh, remain uh, primarily a responsibility, as I've said, for the provincial jurisdiction. Let's get back to the state of the nation's economy with a political question. 
um, universality. You are totally committed to universality in all programs. I am committed to our universal programs, right. And there will be no tinkering with family allowances at all? No, sir. In other words, the middle class will still get, although they're taxed back, all these universal allowances? That's part of the liberal commitment, yes. Why did Monique Bejan suddenly disappear so quickly from the scene? She was the one who was fighting the doctors. She, uh, as a matter of fact, Monique, uh, Monique and I our good friend. She supported me, as you know, for the leadership of our party. No, I didn't know. Well, she did. And when she, um, when uh, I'd formed a government, she came to see me in my, my home and told me that for two years she uh, had had a, an appointment available to her at Notre Dame University down in Indiana, and she now wanted to take it up. She, she didn't... I thought maybe she and you had classed on a, no. a balanced billing for doctors. No, I would have been very pleased to have had her remain and run as a candidate. She's You're committed against extra billing by doctors and under the National Health Plan? Yes, sir. Totally all the way? Yes, sir. How, how embarrassed have you been by the, the split in your cabinet demonstrated by Iona Campagnola on the nuclear freeze? Well, Iona is not yet in my cabinet, but she, uh, she will be. If she had said that while, you were, well, while she was in your cabinet, you'd there, have fired that. There's a, there's a wide range of views in the country on the issue of the freeze, Jack, as you know, and there's a wide range of opinion within the Liberal Party. And what I have said, I respect that sentiment for a freeze. I understand the, 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 uh, the, the anxiety on the part of Canadians that we're living under the threat of nuclear annihilation. Right. And the only, uh, the only issue is how do we achieve a freeze? And I say, look, a freeze is not as important as a reduction. What we really want to do is reduce the, the entire threshold of, uh, of nuclear armament. We want to bring it down to zero. I mean, a freeze wouldn't be sufficient, in my view. It's a reduction that we're moving towards. And I'm saying to Canadians, I understand what you're saying. I sympathize with what you're saying. But as long as I have the responsibility of government, I'm going to do it and move towards peace in a way that's going to work. And the only way that's going to work is if we move in concert with our allies. We are a member of an alliance. We retain credibility in that alliance only if we move with our alliance and persuade our allies within that alliance. And that's my position. All right, set this one up. Is it correct that as prime minister responsible for our, 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 our treaties with our allies, that you cannot have a private opinion on that treaty? In other words, I'm saying to you, are you personally in favor of a nuclear freeze? I'm saying just as uh, uh, the country will have to accept my public opinion on, on, the, on the freeze, uh, as it accepts my public opinion, say, on a very personal issue like abortion, that it's the public view that, uh, that is relevant and that I'm saying to Canadians, despite what my sentiments might be, the effective way of achieving what Canadians want to achieve is to move with our allies. What would happen if Canada moved unilaterally and said, uh, uh, no cruise missiles and we want to freeze. Would we not be kicked right out of NATO? Well, we'd certainly have less, uh, less clout in NATO and we certainly have less influence with the, the Americans and our European allies who are absolutely essential as part of the bargaining to solving this problem. Mulroney says he's going to spend more money on the armed forces and give them back their uniforms. You're going to take some of your 300 million petty cash, spare cash for promises from the armed forces. Who's right? No, I didn't, uh, well, Mulroney, uh, is Remember, Mul Mul Mulroney's defense commitments, as we've costed them, are about $750 million a year. I mean, these extra defense com commitments. I have said that we will live up to our commitments under our defense alliances. Mm -hmm. I understand that in dollar terms, we are doing that. Now, I'm not, uh, I haven't had an opportunity of looking into weapons procurement or the style and standard of our forces. Uh, that's something I'll have time to do after right. September 4th. So uh, I'm just saying we will live up to those commitments. And uh, what do you make of Mulroney's province? He says he flipped his gasket, got, but is he a contradiction in terms? I got a book right here, Jack. It's got 338 promises in it. This is Mulroney's book? No, this is my book. This is my book with Mulroney's promises, 338. And if he doesn't cost those tomorrow, we'll have something to say about it. Well, it's only going to cost 20 or 30 billion. Well, what was it Crosby said? Crosby said that it was conceivable that that could amount to $20 billion. Final segment, and I hope to take some telephone calls in this segment too. Oh, maybe not, maybe we've got two segments with the Prime Minister after the break. As the polls stand right now, Mr. Turner, and you're going into the election, 
it's said by all the experts that you're going to get wiped out in quadra. You know something, Jack? There's only one poll that counts. And what, what, you know, what these polls and, and a lot of your colleagues in the media are saying is, don't bother showing up, Canadians. Don't bother showing up on September 4th. It's all over. We've told you that the country's made up its mind, so don't bother voting. I believe fundamentally that there's only one poll that counts, and that's September 4th, that a lot of Canadians are still making up their minds, and they're going to concentrate in this week on the issues, the future of our country and jobs and how we compete. Now, Quadra, we're running very well in Quadra. And I'm saying to the people of Quadra, look, I'm out here again in British Columbia. I've come home, I've got roots in this riding. My family lived in the riding for 25 years. My grandparents lived in the riding for 25 years. I've said that I want British Columbia and the West to become part of the mainstream of our country again. I understand the remoteness and the frustration, the alienation out here. Look, I'm going to give Vancouver Quadra a national voice. Is that is what you're saying really in reverse, if the polls are right, better to elect the, national, the leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition than the brilliant Mr. Clark, who is backbencher number 99. Is that what you're saying this morning? I am not mentioning Mr. Clark. I'm saying, look. But would you I'm, rather be elected? I'm, I am saying, look. You have a chance of electing a Prime Minister of Canada and you have a chance of a national voice in Ottawa from British Columbia and a moderate, progressive, common sense voice, the type of voice we're again going to have to have in the legislature of British Columbia as well. But are you also saying the least you should do is elect the leader of the opposition? I'm saying that you have the opportunity of electing a national voice from Vancouver Quadra, the first time that that has happened in over 100 years. A hypothetical question which I, I'd like you to answer, sir. If defeated in Quadra, and if your government is defeated nationally, will you go back to your directorships, or will you stay as leader of the House of Commons seeking a new seat in the House? Leader of the opposition seeking a new seat in the House. Jack, let me put this in the way that I know you'll understand. Mm -hmm. I expect to win the election. I expect, with the support of the people in Vancouver Quadra, to be returned as a member of Parliament here from Vancouver. Mm -hmm. I, my commitment is absolutely total to the parliamentary process and to the Liberal Party. And I'm here until the Liberal Party decides in its good judgment that I'm no longer needed and that's going to be years away or as long as my health holds out. That's, uh, your health, how is it? My health's excellent. But, uh, e even but after this miserable campaign? Uh, I've been going since March the 4th and by September 4th that'll be six, uh, six months on the road. It's been a great education. It's been a great panorama of Canada. But uh, I won't mind a day or two off when it's over. It was a mistake to call the election early. You should have waited till after the Pope's visit, shouldn't you, sir? Well, here again, uh, we had the Queen's visit, we had the Pope's visit, we had a million and a half unemployed, and I said that after the uncertainty that the country's gone through, Jack, I mean, Trudeau uh, was resigning and not resigning, there was un uncertainty in the country for two or three years, investment was being held up, jobs were being held up, and I said, look, the country deserves a chance to clear the air, let's have it out. I believe that was in the interest of the country. Um, in any circumstances, would you consider a coalition with the NDP? Absolutely hypothetical. I'm counting on a majority government. How about absolutely not? No. What? A coalition? A coalition. I, don't, uh, I don't think we'd contemplate a coalition. Fair enough. Let's try a couple of calls. Where am I going to go, Steve? Now, just a word of caution. It's my first day back. If you've got a question for the Prime Minister, Ask the question. No speeches. Go ahead, please. Hello. Yes. Good morning, uh, the Prime Minister. Go I'm uh, one of these, I'm sure I'm talking for 100,000 Canadians that are, don't have a job and that uh, they have experience behind them. And the only way they really find a way of being able to get productive again is to start their own business. And you were uh, saying earlier on in your campaign about a $10,000 uh, deals to get um, people, young people, started in uh, in their own business, which I'm very much in favor for. And you want to know about it? Yes, I would. I'd like to know the right details, please. Right. Well, I've, I've, I've said that I believe that the um, real employer of the future is going to be small business. And I want to encourage young people who haven't any capital behind them, young men and women, to get into, into small business. How does he business. get his 10000 Well, there's $5,000 that's available to uh, prepare a, a statement of, and a balance sheet of how the business would work pro forma, getting some, some advice as to how to put it together. And 5000 available also in terms of consultancy as to how to market and, and, and how to get out and, and put, it, uh, put it into operation. 
that will uh, that won't be just money that's just let out without uh, without monitoring. The young person will have to put a good plan together. That'll be available, by the way. We're setting up offices of Small Business Canada in every um, in every federal development bank office across the country. So go to Small Business Canada. They'll give you that information. This won't be like the previous job handouts where the Liberal MPs got a 45-day start on the Tories, will it? You know something, Jack. The the problem with approaching government these days, it's so darn complicated. You've got to go from department to department. For small business, we're giving the small business man and woman one-stop shopping. You go to Small Business Canada. You don't need a member of parliament. You don't even need a liberal member of parliament. That'll be a change, won't it, sir? Yes, go ahead from hope, please. Jack? Yes. Yes, I would like to ask the prime minister what he's intending to do with uh, people over 55 that can uh, not uh, find a job anymore if uh, Canada is going to intend to make a pre-pension or what are they going to do with those people that's too old for to find a job right now and if it's not eligible for a pension? Good question. Well, we, we still hope that there are going to be opportunities of training and retraining for, for your age group. Certainly in terms of pension plans, we're going to have to look for ways and together with the provinces and together with industry for lowering that age to meet circumstances you're describing. Uh, I said earlier that it's my philosophy and the philosophy of our government that nobody who retires should do so without a decent pe pension to retire in some sort of dignity. I, uh, I hope that either by training or retraining or by some ultimate reform in the pension uh, schemes of this country, pension plans of this country, we can cover your position. But hopefully you can get back to work and I, I, I urge you to keep trying. But the fact of the matter is we can't afford any fancy plans at all just now because of the state of the deficit, the state of the economy. Nobody's really told us how brutally bad things are in this country just now. Can we afford well, the safety nets unlimitedly? We the can, Americans don't have them. I tell you, I've told the country just where we stand and just, uh, just uh, what we have to do as a country to get back into a, an expansion economy. We've got to be more productive. We've got to be more effective. I'm going to be talking about that at noon in Vancouver. We've got to be more efficient. We've got to pull together between labor and, 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 and business between the federal government and the provinces. Right. We can't enjoy anymore the luxury of fighting internally as a country as we've done over the last At the beginning years. of the campaign, it was commonly said by smart alecks like Fotheringham and all these eastern wits that Turner and Mulroney were in fact clones. Corporate lawyers, boys in booth suit, fluently bilingual, charming, gracious, magnificent road scholars, etc. And I, th I went along with that for a while. I thought, no difference between you and Mulroney. Now, I can see you now good old-fashioned left-wing liberal, correct? I'm a liberal and always have been, and I'm operating, with the, w operating within the philosophical boundaries of my party. Mulroney is attempting to pretend he's a liberal, but his party hasn't changed. How far to the right is Mulroney when you go through his 380 promises? How far to the right is the wee Irishman for Quebec? Well, I tell you, he's, uh, I don't think his party has seen all those promises. But when you go to the very soul of the Conservative Party, here's a party that in its questionnaire a year and a half ago got all the delegates to say where they stood. 75% were against affirmative action for women. 75% were against uh, affirmative action for minority rights. 50% wanted to reduce unemployment insurance, etc., etc. That's the real Tory party. That is a real Tory party, and that is why Mr. Mulroney will have to be a good deal different from me because he's operating within the bounds of the Conservative Party and I am a liberal. You mean he and Sink Stevens are really philosophical soulmates? Uh, he's going to have to live with Sink Stevens and John Crosby and uh, Mackenzie and, and, and the rest of them. You thanks know? to you and Mr. Trudeau, if he does get into power, he's got no vacancies to put them into. They've all been appointed. Well, Jack. Uh, Tell me this. When you go through this, if re-elected, will you recall, after a decent time, some of these appointments which annoyed you? The Trudeau no-option deal with Turner. I'll, uh, as I say, uh, I'll live up to I'll live up to that commitment, the commitment which uh, the prime minister could have fulfilled himself if he had or wanted to. But I, uh, it's a well, new, which it, but, but but it's a new slate, Jack, and uh, I'm going for quality and merit and consultation with the groups from which they come. And uh, I was proud of how I handled appointments when I was minister of justice and minister of consumer affairs. And I think, Jack, when I'm back here again. Uh, even you might uh, give me a friendly smile on this. Ah, oh, you're safe for me. I ain't looking for no Senate seat, Mr. Turner. <laughs> Go ahead to John Turner. Well, good morning, Mr. Turner. And um, I want to 
just say that the first public forum this election, the first town hall meeting, as you call them, in Quadra, will be held on Wednesday, August 29th at 7.30 p.m. Oh, what a crafty and little plug for you, John. Is this... Uh, no, she wants... She want, that's not Brenda, is it? No, Brenda's back... Uh, Brenda's back uh, handling another writing at the moment. I know about that particular meeting, and I've told the people who are sponsoring it that, unfortunately, I've got some obligations as leading oh. this party. I, I can't get to those meetings, and I, I apologize. This is instead of your quadra town hall. I, now, let's give me ask no, you one no, question. No, no, what, I, what I said to the people of Quadra, Jack, that, uh, that as an undertaking to the people, that uh, I would uh, do the same sort of thing that I did in my former two ridings, mm -hmm. one in Montreal and one outside of Ottawa. I would hold town hall meetings every six months and that the people of Quadra could come to an open meeting, televised, and any citizen of Quadra, or Vancouver for that matter, could put a question to me publicly, and the meeting would only end when all the questions had been exhausted and properly answered. That's what I've undertaken to do. That's why she was referring, I think, to a town hall meeting. Have you been to see the new developments at the, at the, and research at UBC? I uh, went out there on Did you Saturday. Do, you went there? I saw the you saw it? I saw the brain scanning uh, equipment, which is world famous and unique. I saw the magnetic brain scanner. Get off the hook. Well, uh, you know what I mean. I'm that's my alma mater. I'm, oh, pr I'm, pr I'm proud of what they're doing out there. It was there. your sister who said to me, you make sure you ask my brother if he's been out and shame him if he hasn't been out. Well. You went. I went. All that's is forgiven. Thank you. Election night prediction. I mean, can I take you seriously? Do you seriously suggest that with these polls, which give 200 seats to the Tories, at least maybe 180 to 220, that you can win the election, Prime Minister? I think Canadians are still making up their minds, Jack. And I'm not going to give you any numbers. I never have got into that game. And if they choose the but Tories, what do they face? They, they face either, they face on these promises, either welshing or reneging on those promises, or, you, or the country faces higher taxes, or because of the massive amounts involved here, the country faces cutting some of our social programs to, face, uh, to pay for it. Okay. My thanks to John Turner, Prime Minister of Canada. Broadbent will be here on uh, Wednesday, but in the meantime, Webster will do his first free for all, first program of the new season for this winter after the break. Thanks, Prime Minister. Thank you, Jack. Thank you very much. It's not easy to get back to work, a 90-minute live television program each and every day after being off since the end of April. I was, however, at the Liberal Convention in Ottawa, and I was the guy who put it to Turner that uh, would he have guts enough to run in the West. I thought he should have run in Capilano, which is a kind of snobby constituency <coughs> where I would have thought they were more likely to vote for a prime minister. I have been involved in the public prints recently, over the non-appearance of Mr. Mulroney, the leader of the Conservative Party on this program. And if anybody asks me, I'll tell you the story. But in the meantime, I'm going to go to the phones. Um, I'm just going to take phone calls back and see what you thought of Turner. Will I go down the line, Stevie, or will I? I'll go there three. Go ahead, please. Hello. Nobody wants to talk to me. Turner's gone. Are you there? I'm here. Well, John Turner, the Prime Minister, has gone, and uh, you can talk to me. Tell me what you thought of him. I just wanted to give three points. Three first points. Of all, first of all, I'm not a liberal. Secondly, I enjoyed that program. I thought he answered well without too much equivocation. So did I, as a matter of fact. Pardon? So did I. Oh, good. <laughs> and thirdly, I think uh, Brian Mulroney will regret not appearing on your program. Well, we mustn't get too big-headed about it. What I objected to was the fact that these, these Eastern politicians take this damned arrogant business that they're ahead in the polls, they don't have to talk. That's it. I mean, it's just, it's a disgraceful way to run a political campaign. If a guy can't answer questions, and I was not soft on Turner this morning, anything but no. soft. I agree. I mean, the guy's a prime minister, and you can't bring out a gun and force him to answer, but he was remarkably direct this morning. Mulroney could wipe the floor with me, but it's the guys in the East that think that Webster's a bit of a boo and a bit of a loudmouth, so therefore just let's keep him away. But the difference with Webster is that when somebody crosses me like that, I tell the public about it. Yep, because it's an insult to us. You're damn right it is. Yep. All of us. 
The phone's going to be a bit noisy first morning back. We'll have to get rid of that click. Go ahead from the Sunshine Coast. Yes, hello, Mr. Webster. Yes, ma'am. Um, you asked for no speeches, so I won't give you any. But Mr. Turner, in my opinion, I feel is a chauvinist, he's biased, he's a crude man. And how dare he put women in a category to quote him, we will allow them to enter the workforce. I think he's disgusting. I'm not aware of that particular nuance. Possibly or not, because you also are a chauvinist. Oh, but I admit it. I'm not really a chauvinist, but you can't take an old war horse like me well, and I suddenly turn him into a hippie kid with a t-shirt, <laughs> smooth mustache, and my hand and my hip. I think he's a very weak man, and as far as I'm concerned... You talking about Webster or Turner? I'm not a weak man, to hell with you. <laughs> Come, Klups. Go ahead, please. Hello. It's great to be back. Go ahead, please. Hello. Yes. Yes, uh, I'd like to talk about some of the individuals running in the liberal uh, campaign and how much we believe, how much we, we believe that it's a All solo. right, give me the names first, and I'll tell you if you can talk about them. <laughs> uh, Who do you want to talk about? Me? Eh? I want to talk about a starvation fast that I'll be on until from now until later. Well, why don't you go to the newspapers or to some local television station and get some publicity first, and when you're recognized, I'll talk to you. Can he read the numbers this year? Go ahead, please. Hello. Hello, Jack. Yeah. Um, it's great to hear you back at this time of day. Um, BCTV ran a seat projection yesterday on, on the news. Yes, I've got it here. Uh, well, am I, are my numbers correct? 228 conservative, 51 liberal, 9 NDP? 221 conservative. A 51 Liberal, 10 NDP, that was on the basis of the Southern Pole, Carleton University, 57% Tory, 27% Lib, and 50% NDP. Okay, no one yet has suggested the possibility of an NDP official opposition, and I'm just interested in your reaction to that. If because, of the, because of the basic strength of the Liberals in Quebec, even if they lose 40 seats, they are bound to have more seats in the House of Commons than the NDP. If they pick up 20 seats of the 75 in Quebec, which is a bare minimum, they will still be the official opposition. Although in 1962, I think it was, no, 58, 58, after the Diefenbaker sweep, the rump parliament of the Liberals gave them only 48 seats. And the NDP had nine. So there's no prospect of the NDP being the official opposition, I would say. Because of the liberal strong, well, what's left of the liberal stronghold in Quebec. Okay? It's, it's an interesting possibility that... Um, I just told you it's not a possibility. Because of Quebec. Okay. Okay. Now just get that in your thick head and keep it there. Well, these are my friends. Those people are looking in amazement because I'm talking to callers like that. These people have known me for 85 years. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Jack. Morning. Uh, welcome you back. Yeah. Okay, what I was going to ask you was the point of view was the fact that Mr. Turner was on our program this morning and that he didn't mention, he mentioned the fact about having the training programs for our young people, but yeah. at the same time, he's forgetting about all our trained people that are out of work at the present time. Well, I tried to hammer that point with them about the unemployed man in Kamloops, but they have a big, big, we have a huge problem in this country with 524,000 people between the ages of 17 and 25 who've never had a job. Well, maybe you should look at the educational system we have in our country, too. You and I both know this. We know perfectly well that the apprenticeship program in British Columbia has always been limping along in disjointed sequence with the unions, the provincial government, the federal government, the new immigrants taking places and all the rest of it, and there's never been a proper coordination of the job training resources available in this country. But as, you, as I put it to Turner quite bluntly, nobody really can do anything until the world trade and the economy picks up. That's the truth. That's the fact of the matter. Or unless we go like the states where there's still freedom to start. Okay, Thank God we don't have freedom to stars. We have more of a sharing uh, thing than... Cam Lopez, go ahead. Good morning, Jack. Welcome back. 
Thank you. Uh, with respect to employment, uh, the creation of new jobs is only part of the employment problem. Uh, to uh, fix the problem, pardon me. The other half of it is that you have to try and save jobs that are already there. Uh, people are losing jobs to modern technology, to other, uh, and to union uh, and to profiteering steadily. Um, Mr. Turner didn't uh, bring up that point at all of how to save jobs that are already... If he didn't bring up the point, it was because I didn't ask him. I must give Turner credit. I gave him a couple of pretty raw questions there, and he tackled everyone without the slightest embarrassment. That's right, Jack. But I started off... I was impressed with her. We had five jobs per train. Now we have four, now it's three, and now they're going to take the caboose off and it's only going to be two. We're what? losing our jobs every day. What's your and trade? I'm looking forward to Mr. Cook when he comes on your show. What's he has your some pretty rash comments for you. What's your trade? Pardon me? What is your trade? I can barely hear you, Jack. What is your trade? My trade? Yes. I'm a trainman. Oh yeah, of course, you're right. Goodbye. I'll deal with the cook when he comes here. Okay, okay. bye. Back after the break. You people who work all year, you know, have no idea how difficult it is to get back into harness after being off all of the summer. So if I'm a little slow-witted this morning, you'll just have to forgive me because I depend on your calls, your information, and your remarks to keep me on my toes, which are not nearly as stubby as they used to be. I trust you've noticed the new Webster. And I'm not wearing a goidel. What you see is what you get. Talking about what you see is what you get, I didn't get Mulroney. But I did interview him in March 1983. And he was very bright in the program. And I'm going to pick out a little clip so that nobody can say I don't give Mulroney equal time. It's 18 months old, but here's what he, how he predicted the election when he was fighting Joe Clark, the federal How election. many seats can Mulroney win in Quebec to make him really attractive to the West? I'll tell you exactly how many. The day after? I No, sir. I'll tell you today. I'll win as just enough seats to form a genuine, national, progressive, conservative, majority government. And let me tell you something, Jack. You mean across the country across or in Quebec? Across the country, there will be enough seats from French Canada to join with the seats from British Columbia and elsewhere to form a majority, progressive, conservative government. Are you telling me Ontario does not matter if you're the leader of the party? Oh, no, I didn't say that. Indeed, it matters. Uh, but you said I, you could, with Quebec, Alberta, British Columbia, well, majority government. Well, it, uh, what I meant, of course, was Ontario as well. That's 18 months old. I threw it in. At that time, he was predicting roughly 150 seats. The pollsters are predicting for him anything between 180 and 220 seats. And let me tell you this, that will be exceedingly unhealthy for the nation. Mind you, I think Mulroney's got a better grasp on himself than Diefenbaker ever had. It was the massive majority that Diefenbaker had in the 50s that destroyed his own government, apart from, of course, the, t the old Tory habit of eating their young. But uh, Mulroney, apart from not being able to decide his own speaking dates, seems to be a brighter guy than Diefenbaker was. Uh, Go ahead, please. Good morning, Jack. Morning, sir. Good morning, Jack. Morning. Uh, with regard to your statements earlier with the Prime Minister... Yes? Have you got your sound up? Have you forgotten to turn down your sound? Turn it off. Turn it down! Yes, I'm sorry. The Tell the old lady not to be so... Oh, no, that's a sexist remark. Tell whoever's in the room, please, to turn down the sound. Right. I've done, Jack, yep. Right. The, uh, conversation with your um, Prime Minister with regard to the $50 uh, for students, uh, when you said that the federal government should be in uh, um, giving us more assistance, correct, because we in Vancouver, particularly with the Vancouver School Board, have had an excellent career preparation program which has been operating in conjunction with the firms. Just answer me a question. Companies. Who will you vote for in this election? I beg your pardon? Who will you vote for in this election? I am voting, well... Well, I... tell me. It's no secret. Because I don't want to hear about career preparation in Vancouver School Board this morning. I wanted a light, bright, lively response. Go ahead, please. Morning, Jack. Morning. Yes, uh, two questions, please. 
Yep. Um, is it feasible um, for the government to make the retirement age to 60 instead of 65 to create more jobs as the people retire? Or is it true that the Canadian pension plan is really going broke? And also, is it not possible that we could have a national referendum of all the people of Canada to vote yes or no on the nuclear freeze and the return to capital punishment? And could you tell me your own opinion on the nuclear freeze and the capital punishment issue? Oh, good. Nuclear freeze, capital punishment. Uh, what was the first one? Quick. Pensions. Pensions. Reducing the pension age, as you'd be told by any Canadian politician, even the NDP, is totally impractical at age 60 as of now. As far as the nuclear freeze is concerned, I believe we've got to stick by our alliances, and I believe that disarming yourself in front of the Russians, and I ain't no Reagan fan, is an invitation to trouble. It must be done gradually, coolly. As far as capital punishment is concerned, let me give you, in all fairness, what that Mr. Mulroney, the elusive Mr. Mulroney, the no-talky Mr. Mulroney, the do as Norman Atkins tells him Mr. Mulroney. Let me give you what Mr. Mulroney said in that celebrated interview when he was allowed to talk to me in March 19. Is it queued up? Here we go again. Five seconds. Mulroney, March 83, on capital punishment. What about capital punishment? Well, capital punishment is... Um is a real tough one. I, in 1975, said that um, it should be a 25-year mandatory uh, non-reviewable sentence for a capital offense, and I still feel that way because uh, there is no evidence in that uh, the deterrent factor uh, sustains the other view. In fact, Does that mean you're against capital punishment? I am against capital uh, punishment, uh, Jack, but it's the kind of issue where it must come now to a free and an unfettered vote in the House of Commons because it is so sensitive and it captivates the interest of the Canadian people in such a compelling way. If there were a demand in the House of Commons and you were in control, you would recommend a free vote of the House and totally abide by the decision yes, of the House? Yes, I would. Now, that's what he thought in 1983. It may well be that he's totally somersaulted and uh, now wouldn't give a free vote. I don't know. That's what he said in 83 and he won't talk to me. So boo to Mr. Moroni. See, I'm in a snit this morning. And I'll be, no, I'm not really in a snit. It's the uh, party backroom boys that give me a pain in the neck after the break. <laughs> Don't forget Ed Broadbent, who is a key player in this campaign. Kid yourself not, I'll tell you. Uh, Wednesday morning, and I've I'm back a week early, as you can see. I'm not normally due back until after Labor Day, but I had to get into the act so that I know something of what I'm talking about by the time we do the national election coverage uh, on election night. Go ahead from Duncan. Duncan? Yeah, hello. Ready? Speak up, please. Yeah, good morning, Jack. Yeah. You know, everybody's talking so much about unemployment and everything. Uh, what did you think of Turner this morning? Oh, I thought both of you were pretty good. As a matter of fact, you know, we hadn't made up our mind who to vote for before, but uh, we're going to vote Liberal this time. My goodness gracious me, I never thought I would ever happen from a program of mine. Go ahead, please. Have you pardon? I chew, ma'am. It's me. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, on the issue of women, during the last debate, all three political parties promised not to discriminate the women and treat them equally. I wish to draw the attention of all Canadians to the fact that the Liberals has already proven this but by appointing Madame Jean Sauvé as a general, Governor General of Canada. Okay, that's a very good point. I'm glad to listen to you. You have two problems. One, the Prime Minister has gone, and two, you've left the sound up in your television set. Now, all of you people out there, I'm back. Get your wits about you. When you come on, turn the sound down. Be ready to ask questions. Time is valuable. And I welcome you at every little contribution. All I do in quiet days. Go ahead, please. Good morning. Good morning. Say, um, uh, back on the subject of um, students from 18 to 25 not getting work. Yeah. There are people that have already been educated not getting work. Why are our school systems so bloody outdated anyway? Don't know. Having a clue. 
Go ahead, please. Hello, is that me? That's you, ma'am. What do you oh. think of Tenner? I like him very much, and I... Uh, what, you mean this guy who stumbled all through the campaign? Well, it was a bit of a rude awakening, I think. Yeah, for him, it must have been. Yeah, but I, uh, what I wanted to mention was that all this is about patronage. Yeah. And Brian Maroney himself said, off the record, mind you, so nobody, nobody makes a big deal about it, that he would have done the same thing. No, no, he talked about old political ladies of the night, as I recall. No, he said... He said, he he, said that uh, there were 3,500 Tories who wanted appointments and that when he finally ran out of them 20 years from now, he might appoint the Liberal. Yeah. That's he what said he said. That was done off the record, but to well, people talk more freely off the record, I think, than... But anyhow... What these, politicians, what these politicians yeah. are learning now is that there is no such thing as off the record at the back of the bus. No. But what I, uh, what I really wanted, uh, Mr. Maroney has the worst kind of patronage right now. What's that? I don't know why anybody hasn't noticed it. The uh, ads on TV and during the Olympics when they must have been very, very expensive. He's got about 10 to every one of the other parties. And well, that costs a lot of money. And a proportion is paid by the taxpayer, I understand. Go ahead from Kelowna. Yeah, good morning, Jack. Glad to have you back. Um, Prime Minister uh, Turner told us how he feels about the polls in a last defense. I'd like to know how you feel about the polls. I feel, uh, I feel too, that uh, the polls do tend to, what's the word, to distort the campaign and its closing issues. And as an old purist myself, I kind of object to the polls telling people, don't bother to vote or you're wasting your vote. I know I'm living in the 18th century and that my attitude is not really acceptable nowadays because the fact of the matter is that polls and computers can tell you the result of an election long before voting day comes, but it does reduce the impact of any contribution by the public or the candidates to the actual issues of the day. But you couldn't ban or outlaw polls. At one time, straw polls, straw voting polls were outlawed under the either the provincial or the federal election act, I can't remember which. Go ahead, please. Abbotsford. I just wanted to say that um, I, I'm scared with the two candidates that are running for prime minister, and I'm going to vote NDP this time. Thank you, ma'am. That's a perfectly valid thing to state of mind in which to be. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, this morning you said that you would reveal what Brian Mulroney, why Brian Mulroney would not appear on the program. I don't believe that question's been asked. Well, I haven't got time now, but I dealt with it in extenso on the newscasts here, there, and everywhere. But I'll certainly tell you about it when some of the Tory candidates are on tomorrow morning. Okay, that's a promise. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Back. After the break. Maybe was afraid. That's magic. Second day back tomorrow, a clutch of politicians. Bill Clark, I believe he's running in Quadra against the PM. Cook, who insulted me the other day. Manning, Ian Waddle. Good fun. Webster, 9 a.m. precisely.